Grace and peace in the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. One of my constant companions growing up was a treasured book of Calvin and Hobbes comics. There's a great one that that I've remembered for a long time. It takes place at bedtime. Calvin is resisting his parents' desire for him to go to bed says, why can't I stay up late? You guys can. And the next panel shows him pouting and shouting, it's not fair. His dad replies with the words we've all heard many times, the world isn't fair, Calvin. The final panel shows Calvin stomping away, muttering to himself, I know, but why isn't it ever unfair in my favor? Has anyone ever felt like Calvin in this comic strip? I, I think that the idea of fairness is one of the most powerful concepts in our world. Children seem to understand fairness almost intuitively. Give one child a better present, or a longer turn on the swings, or a later bedtime, or a bigger bike, and they will always notice. Most of us, I suspect, have felt like Calvin at one time or another. It's not fair that my grandfather has cancer, or that my mom lost her job, or that the teacher gave me a B- minus instead of the B I deserved. And indeed, when we start to to dig into the idea of fairness, it doesn't really seem like the world is very fair. Some people seem to do really well with very little effort. Others work hard but end up with no job to show for it. Disease, war, all of these things seem to happen without any regard for fairness. In some places in the Bible, and often in our culture today, there's a kind of common sense wisdom that says righteousness should be rewarded and evil will be punished. And it seems fair to think that the greatest blessings of God should be reserved for those who are most most faithful and that the worst experiences of the world should belong to those who treat others poorly. But the book of Job disagrees. In fact, some ways, the entire book of Job is a rejection of the notion that blessings come from righteous living and hardships come from unfaithfulness. In the beginning of the book, Job is presented as almost a mythically perfect character whose life is filled with blessings because of his righteousness. And this is what sparks the conversation between God and Satan. The idea that Job is only faithful because of the riches he has. And if that is taken away, Satan suggests to God, Job's faith will fall apart. When Job becomes cursed and his riches disappear, the book of Job relates the speeches of his friends and family who constantly suggest that Job has made some kind of mistake, that Job has brought this misfortune upon himself. This too is a a common belief in our world. When someone we don't like has a disaster, there's usually that nasty little part of our brain that tells us, well, They're just getting what's coming to them. But when something bad happens to us, we never say things like, oh, I really had that coming. From our point of view, from Job's point of view, bad things that happen to us are always unfair and undeserved. Well, bad things that happen to other people can be a sign of justice in the universe. This is why Job is so forceful in his anger against God. Job demands the chance to account for his righteousness, to prove that he was and is righteous and that the misfortune 
that happened to him was something he did not deserve. God answers Job's demands for justice with a speech about the wonders of the universe that Job cannot comprehend. It might seem like God isn't really answering the question or that God is avoiding the question because Job's suffering seems like it might be God's fault. But in God's answer is the real answer that righteousness never guarantees prosperity or wealth and that wickedness never guarantees failure or disaster. In our reading last week, Job said, Therefore I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. If the story just ended here, it would sort of make sense. God has shown God's unbelievable majesty, and Job has been humbled. But the ending we actually have that we heard today goes further, and it tells about the restoration of Job's fortunes. And the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he had prayed for his friends. And the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. The Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. And he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 donkeys. How could it be possible after all this, all the suffering that Job has gone through, that his fortunes could be restored? Some readings of Job say that this renewed prosperity is Job's reward for staying faithful to God during his times of difficulty. That's also a popular position in our world, to tell people who are suffering that God will reward them someday for being faithful, either in earthly prosperity or the gift of eternal life. But I don't think that's actually the point. God doesn't say anywhere that Job is rewarded for his faithfulness or that the renewal of wealth was a condition of his faith. One author says it this way, God's reasons for giving things to Job are as unexplained as the reasons they were taken away. God does not explain suffering, but God does not explain blessing either. In the book of Job, the point is not that when bad things happen, God is showing us disfavor. The point is also not that when good things happen, God is blessing us for our righteousness. The whole point of the story of Job is that God never abandons us, even through the greatest disasters that can happen in life. God's love is never conditional on our behavior or our situation. Most of us would like to think that the blessings in our lives are rewards, but it turns out that the only way for God's grace to be truly grace, to be a gift of love that is freely given, is if there's no way for us to earn it. So counterintuitively, unexpectedly, it is the very fact that God does not curse us with disaster nor reward us with wealth that makes God's grace possible. One last note I'd like to make. I don't mean to suggest that following the teachings of Jesus has no impact on our lives or that ignoring the Ten Commandments is somehow a good thing to do, but I do believe there's an important distinction between judgment and consequences. When we lie or steal or commit adultery or kill people or break any of the Ten Commandments or the teachings of Jesus, there are real consequences that happen in our lives because of those actions. Perhaps people trust you less or you lose your job or your relationships suffer. But these things aren't judgments from God on your goodness or evil. They're the natural consequences and effects that we risk when we break those commandments. 
In the same way, being honest, honoring our parents and caring for the most vulnerable people in our world are all actions that influence ourselves and our relationships with other people in positive ways. And so the good things that come from following Jesus aren't a divine reward for faithfulness, but are the natural effects that flow from following the teachings of Jesus. I think this distinction between consequences and judgment is crucial because it allows us not to worry about our own anxiety about whether God loves us or we're good enough, but to focus on the good we can do in our families, our communities, and in our world. And so rather than our success or failure being predetermined, following Jesus will naturally transform our lives because in that journey God has already given us the grace we need for faith through the gift of baptism, the ritual of communion, and through our creation as people made in the beautiful image of God. Amen.